Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game podcast. And we have a repeat guest. Once again, we are today with Paul. But Paul, before we take off, are you prepared to engage? I am fully prepared to engage, Rob. Thanks for having me again. (laughs) <laughs> Happy to have you back because we have with us today Paul Darvazi. He is an educator, game designer, speaker, and writer who works at the intersection of games, culture, and learning. And you can find all about him in the first episode, the first time we met in the podcast, which is episode 104, 104. That was a little bit over two years ago, and we just realized this and you know, started to remember what we were talking about. And it feels like it was yesterday, but you know, two years. Two good years have gone by in many ways. You know, some things not so great, <laughs> like, you know, the, the lost year and so on. But there have been many amazing things going on. And how about we take it from there, Paul? What, is, what has changed since we last met? Well, the question is, what hasn't changed since we last met? Because it feels <laughs> like I'm living in a completely different universe, some weird parallel universe than good old episode 104. So on a, a very personal changes, one is uh, I have transitioned out of teaching at the secondary level, and now I teach at the University of Toronto. I teach games and learning, and I also teach social media and education and other kind of educational technology courses. And that's been very satisfying because particularly the games and learning course allows me to share a lot of ideas that I have about games and education and uh, with young teachers and pre-service teachers. And I feel that it's a great way to impact their practice. So that has been very positive. I've also moved. I I used to live in downtown Toronto. And because of that unmentionable thing that has, you know, robbed us of a year and a half, uh, (laughs) my family, my family and I moved to a semi-rural community outside of Montreal. We're about 40 minutes outside of Montreal. And my wife is originally from this part of the world. So we, we move closer to family and we're just enjoying the fruits of nature and, and a little bit more space. And that has been very positive. I've continued to do a variety of work with game-based learning and with a number of different companies. I worked with the National Association of Secondary School Principals this summer. I've worked with Epic Games. I've worked with UNESCO. So all of those Epic have, Games and UNESCO. I mean, that, that sounds pretty big. <laughs> yeah, they, it, 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 yes, it was, it's, it's been really positive. My work with UNESCO continues, and I had a, a nice stint with uh, some consulting work with Epic Games, helping them think a little bit about how they can integrate Unreal Engine with post-secondary institutions. And that was a lot of fun, and I certainly learned a lot in the process. And in that time, I also founded a company with my partner, Elisa Navarro Chinchilla. And Elisa and I have founded a company called Goldbug Interactive. And we, aside from designing and creating digital games and multimedia, we offer a range of services, anything from corporate training to professional development to speaking at the intersections of games, gamification, game-based learning, training, culture, etc. Wow, seems like at least a mouthful, plenty of things that you're offering right now. And I'd like to, to know a little bit more about the backstory. Like, how did you get there? Like, how did you meet Lisa? How, how is that sort of relationship taking you to, to make such a huge step? Because founding a company and doing these things, especially nowadays that they say, oh, you know, with all the, the things that have happened, you know, taking the risk and starting a company and going all in, like, what does that what does that look like? Well, um, it, it, interestingly enough, and the story begins at a rooftop in Visakhapatnam, India, wow. <laughs> in, in December <laughs> 2019, I believe. Uh, Elisa and I were at the UNESCO MGIEP tech conference together, and we were on a panel. And Elisa is originally and currently living in Mexico City. And I have spent a great deal of time in Mexico City. It's one of my favorite places in the world. So aside from sharing a panel and an interest in games, 
I was uh, exuberant in my love for Mexican culture and Mexican art <laughs> and Mexican food. And, and that gave Elisa and I a lot to talk about and a lot to connect about. And uh, most interestingly, Elisa and I are both were and continue to be very interested in location based games, you know, alternate reality games and using, you know, the physical spaces of cities in order to create, you know, tourism games or, or, or games that allow uh, us to educate people in various cultural institutions. So that all also gave us a lot to talk about. And the origin of our company name plays into this a little bit. And it's far longer story than I think we have time for today. It might be, you know, the, the substance for a future podcast. Our, the name of our company, Goldbug Interactive, originates from an episode in a book by Carl Jung, the, the psychoanalyst. And uh, the book yeah. is called Synchronicity. And it's all about coincidences and how meaningful coincidences can really give us a sense of a larger you know, purpose in life. And in one of the chapters in the book, he was treating somebody, a woman, who really felt imprisoned by her life. She felt that she was very restrained and restricted. And she shared a dream uh, with Carl Jung that she had, which featured a golden scarab beetle. And the golden beetle was a, was a very prominent Egyptian religious symbol for many reasons. And while she was sharing this dream with Carl Jung, there was a tap at the window behind him and he opened the window and there was a scarab beetle that was very close to the one that she described in her dream. And, and this remarkable coincidence was a breakthrough for her. Hmm. And then I, I had weirdly a series of coincidences happen with gold beetles at about the time that I had first read this story. And they're too elaborate to get into and, and they're, they're really kind of <laughs> almost, almost beyond belief. And we were on the rooftop of our hotel with a group of people, including Elisa and I, and we were trading stories. And I was sharing a few of these beetle related coincidences. And Elisa, at the end of my, you know, probably hour long discourse, Elisa stops <laughs> and she pulls out her phone and she showed me a 60 second video that she had produced about exactly that story about Carl Jung and the Beatle, et cetera, et cetera, that she had taken on for a client and, and had created a minute video. And it was almost the perfect crowning to this uh, series of coincidence stories around, around the Golden <laughs> Beetle. So that was a defining moment in our early relationship, and it persisted to give us our company's name, which is Goldbug Interactive. Wow, so, that makes sense. I, I, I just want to interject for a second here, and there might be, you know, have you have you ever heard of I, I don't know that there's a name for this I'm sure but there's a a bias of like when people say oh I'm going to purchase you know a red car of this brand and this that because I haven't seen too many in the city I I just realized there's not too many of them you purchase a car and you start seeing them like every single Everywhere. corner yeah you, you, because you're, you're, our brains are always filtering a lot of information and then they start focusing on this and, you know, we might get into that. But, you know, I have to add, golden bugs are definitely not something that happens very, very often. So even with that bias, I am sure there is a very big, significant coincidence. And most importantly, it meant something for you guys, right? Well, that's that's exactly it. So it's confirmation bias, if I remember correctly. And and yeah, I mean... That it's like it's once you sort of tap in, it's like when you learn a new word, right? You learn a new word and all of a sudden <laughs> you start seeing the word everywhere. There's a there's a there's a name for that phenomenon. But I will say and, and we'll leave this mysterious for the listeners. If I were to share the two or three <laughs> stories that involve gold bugs, you know, starting with reading about it. in a, I was in a Chilean fishing village when I first read Synchronicity by Carl Jung and the gold bug story there. I think it would really push the limits of confirmation bias because it's almost like winning a massive <laughs> lottery in terms of the series of events that, that precipitated from that. So having said that, I'm not deluded. I very much realize that there's all kinds of mathematical explanations for these types of things. And ultimately, much like Carl Jung discusses in his book, I like, you know, I'm, I'm ultimately a student of literature. My background's in literature. I very much live in a world of symbols. And they give meaning to my life. And whether that meaning is generated internally through the way I choose to see the world or it has some substance in the objective world that exists outside of me, I think is something beyond my ability to prove or disprove. But they give you know shape to my life in some way. So as a, as a student of symbols and literature, I choose to, to operate and give them some credence, which is really, but your point is very, very well taken. So that kind of 
created the seed, I would say, for our relationship. And we stayed in touch, not with any any design to start a company together. And about a year later, I was hired by McGill University here in Montreal. It's a it's a Canadian university to help them design a series of online games in order to engage McGill students who would not be able to attend the university due to COVID. And they had originally planned a year-long sort of theme dedicated to games and play at the library, and they'd received a substantial grant to do that. And they had originally thought about creating sort of a murder mystery type experience on the library grounds. And the McGill Library <laughs> System extends to spaces all over the campus. It's not just a single, a single space. And so when COVID hit, they had to abandon their original plan to create this game on site. And they felt like they needed to do something online. And, and I had, in a, again, a weird little coincidence, but I had attended a game conference in Montreal. And during one of the sessions, I turned around and I saw a woman sitting next to me about two seats away who had been my Canadian literature teacher in my undergraduate degree almost 20 years before that moment. And I was like, what the heck is my Canadian literature teacher from 20 years ago doing at a gaming conference? And her name is Natalie Cook. And she she was there because she was exploring different ideas for that dedication to play in games that she was undertaking for the library because she had uh, taken on a job as the assistant dean of libraries at McGill. So we got in touch again. I told her she was one of my favorite profs in university, actually, and I remember her course very well. And we started hmm. talking and she saw that I'd done a lot of work with games and that I, you know, that I was I designed a number of games. So when they had to move the whole thing online, she approached me and we we arrived at, at sort of a partnership where I would help them and the librarians design a series of online games for the university. And once we started, I think the project was a little bit more technically demanding than the library had assumed. And some of the resources weren't necessarily quite at the point where they would allow us to deliver the game in the way that we wanted to. And I was speaking with Elisa at the time about another project that we were kind of, you know, kicking around. And she said, well, listen, let me help you out. I, I have Unity builders. I have all these kind of technical people and artists, and I'd be happy to lend my assistance because it's a project that interests me. I've been recently approached by Montreal about moving my studio there because Montreal and Quebec in general is inviting, you know, sort of the international, you know, digital and interactive community to come to to Quebec and to really build a hub here. And her studio had been approached. So for a variety of reasons, Elisa was kind enough to support me in this project. And we worked together very closely to design two games together. And then she worked with the librarians on the third game. And it was an incredible experience. I mean, we we really, you know, that, that initial sense we had about sharing a lot of ideas and having a, a very kind of very similar vision for trying to make the world a better place and using games for education and supporting social justice issues through games. All of that culminated in a, in a very productive working relationship. And those can be really tough. I've been in a number of creative working relationships and, and you know, they, they, can, <laughs> they can be a mixed bag for, for any number of reasons. And we, <laughs> we, were, we were certainly very well aligned. She's incredibly hardworking, incredibly creative. I think that the fact that we share so many commonalities in terms of our love of Mexican culture and, and any number of other things and a similar sort of approach to game design really led to us working very well together. And then uh, as time went on, even after the McGill games, our, our uh, you know relationship, our professional relationship deepened. And then we started speaking more seriously about starting a company together. And then, you know, that eventually led to founding Goldbug Interactive. Nice, nice. Great backstory. Like all the things that, that happened and started getting together for you guys to, to, you know, start working on this project and launching that initiative. And like, why did you decide, like, you have all this background, you had all these ideas that, that you have been working together You could continue doing that. Like, th there's no reason not to, but you decided to take it sort of a, a step further in the, in the best of senses. What, what pushed you, you and, and of course, both of you in, in that direction? Like, what was that tipping point, perhaps? Or like, how, how did that happen? We, we, we'll be very curious because I'm, I'm sure, I'm definitely convinced that many of the engagers are having some form of that situation in their lives, whether it's, you know, going with a partner or starting themselves a consulting company you know, interactive creations company. There's 
there's many people going out there to do that or even freelancing. So I, I think this could be very valuable for many people out there. Yeah. So that's a great, a great, great question, Rob, as always. You always have very insightful questions. So there's a number of things at play. One is how, while Elisa and I are very aligned in our vision, we come at this from two different directions. We have very much a yin-yang kind of relationship where I come at games through education and she comes at education through games. So Elisa has a much more concrete experience developing digital games. And, and she's got, you know, a whole series of networks of, you know, f- you know modelers and unity builders and, and, and animators and that, that she has worked with for a number of years on, you know, endless projects where the games that I've designed, I've designed a number of games tend to be, you know, alternate reality games, or I'm hacking, you know, various different free platforms together in, in order to, you know, create some kind of a hybrid experience. But I'm ultimately an educator. Uh, you know, my background is in education. I taught for many years, and I'm always thinking about games through an educational lens. And Elisa is too. However, she starts with games and has become increasingly more interested in how she can support education. So, and that doesn't speak to the formalization of our relationship through a company, but that was one way that we complemented each other and how we saw that we had unique strengths that, when brought together, could create some very powerful synergy. Now, the incentive to actually incorporate and not have sort of a more loosey-goosey relationship is a number of things. One is by incorporating our company in Canada and specifically in Quebec, that gives us access to a series of grants. And those grants that are available from various sources are much easier. You know, we'd be barred from getting them otherwise if you have a company, you're incorporated and you're incorporated in Canada. So that was one of the big incentives. It also would formalize our relationship. It made the boundaries very clear. If we were taking on clients or projects, it created a whole financial structure, a whole accounting structure that really should be in place as a company, as opposed to just two individuals working as contractors or or whatever the case may be. And ultimately, it'd be really nice for Lisa to work more closely with me and to be here in Montreal and having the company set up here will greatly facilitate that in the long run. So th- those were the definitely, you know, some of the big kind of cornerstones. And I think it was it was also the, an element of commitment. It really showed that we were committed to making this work and the amount of work that went into starting the company was not insignificant. And I think that really sort of it's our paying our dues to show each other we are, you know, we're in this in the long run and we we really want to make this work. And I think that was an important part of the process for us as well. Yeah, it, it seems like the conditions were already there that you guys, in many ways, you were already sort of committed to working together. And this was, you know, sort of the tipping point more than anything else. It was the years of or, or the many times that you collaborated and you and you at some point decided that you know it seems like we're going to be doing this more and more often how how about we formalize this right exactly and and it also was you know one thing that's really fascinating kind of a, I stepped over this and I think for your listeners and for you personally this might be of interest one thing I had designed a game before the McGill Library game that for a high school that really connected to the school archives. And a lot of the puzzles for the game and a lot of the gameplay were developed around digitized archival material. And one of the reasons that McGill was interested in working with me was because I used that game to show them, look, we can dig into your archives and we can use your archives in many meaningful ways in order to create games so that the your audiences will actually interact with, you know, with maps and old books and in a really fun and engaging way that will make them think about these artifacts in greater detail, but they'll also be essential to the interactive process of these narrative games that we designed. And it's absolutely fascinating, fascinating work. I mean, I love history. I love archives. I love libraries. These are are my, my passions. And the idea of designing games where you can use these obscure old documents, there's so many fun and entertaining documents and magazines and bizarre books that are floating around in libraries and museums that could be leveraged to create incredible puzzles to draw stories from. And I think after our work with McGill, where we, you know, we used their history, their archives, some of their kind of historical figures, and we synthesized all of these into a cohesive kind of narrative, you know, game event. 
it really got us very, very excited about the potential of bringing these ideas to libraries and museums because I haven't seen anything like it. I've, I haven't, I mean, I've, of course, museums have used games for a long time and libraries less so, but are starting to get into that space. But I have not, and they maybe they exist and I just haven't seen them, but I've never experienced these kind of interactive participatory events in the context of a library or museum that uses their archives and their artifacts so essentially as part of the gameplay. And it felt very meaningful. And and unfortunately, a lot of this material just sort of, you know, it's hidden away, away from public view, or it's, it's put under a glass case where you can kind of walk by and look at it and then move on to the next thing. And the really nice thing about a lot of this material becoming digitized is that you can start playing with it. And you can start changing it and you can start inviting audiences to interact with the material in a way that you couldn't before. And both Elisa and I found, you know, that possibility, which became increasingly apparent as we had full, you know, play with the McGill archives and the McGill holdings. It just it was so exciting to us that one of the motivations to start the company was to hopefully attract other institutions and to build on the good work that we'd done with McGill and perhaps take it to the next level in using this material and and connecting audiences to these institutions in a more meaningful way. That makes sense. And precisely in that same direction, because you're you're saying that 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 was part of the work that you were hoping to do. What does what does Golden Bug Interactive actually do? What's your your mission statement? Or I I don't know how you want to you want to play this one. But I just want to know what, what it's all about at this point. So fundamentally, we work at the intersections of games, learning, and social justice, which is a, you know, it's a fairly large mantle. Both Elisa and I have worked and continue to work with various UN agencies. I'm currently working on a project with South Asian youth, with UNESCO and a few other agencies where we're helping them design games in order to prevent violent extremism or support the work of preventing violent extremism. And uh, Elisa has, for example, designed games that sheds light on violence against women in domestic settings in Mexico. And and this type of work is really important to us. So we offer museums, educational institutions, NGOs, or anybody else that is interested in educating their audiences, that's interested in furthering a social justice idea in a more interactive and relevant way, we offer a host of different services that allow you to do it. Everything from creating a digital game, creating an animation, to hosting interactive workshops or game jams, or helping you as an enterprise to include game elements in, and creating a much more engaging, for example, you know, sort of training workshop, or you know, if you want to undertake a cultural shift in your company and, and, and you want to get some lessons across beyond a PowerPoint presentation or sitting around with large pieces of paper and markers, we draw from a vast experience of game design, of ways of engaging and interacting and differentiating in order to create much more dynamic opportunities for learning and often, hopefully, through a lens that will have a positive effect in the world. Hmm. Very interesting. In fact, you were saying that, and I was, I was thinking of Dr. Philip Bush, who I interviewed quite a while ago, and is actually right now, he moved on from that role he was doing at that point and is doing something else as well. But the main thing here is that Philip, uh, he used to work for the GIZ, which is a German foundation that was, amongst many other things, supporting the peace process in Yemen. And they were creating games there as well as a, as a form of peace and peacekeeping and peace building, especially. So I don't know, maybe if, if you want, I can connect you to because it could be something interesting for you to explore together. Maybe his experience, I'm not sure if he's doing exactly the same thing. I know he, he sort of opened his own uh, consultancy or something like that. I have to catch up with him, by the way. But uh, I, I know he has plenty of experience in that because he was literally working on a foundation and describing his days in the episode. It was funny because he, all, he, he said that most of the times he wakes up in a hotel <laughs> because he's sort of moving around the world doing these things with it, with the foundation. So I, I think it could be a very interesting character. For you that to is the with. life of a rock star. Well, Rob, listen, I know it's likely confirmation bias, but the reason I know <laughs> Philip Bush so well, or I know the name so well, and I know his work so well, is because he has actually worked very closely with my partner, Elisa. And, and, Elisa, and he regularly sends Elisa 
potential work or, or potential organizations that we may want to work with. So, uh, so full circle, full circle. I, <laughs> I, I did not know about Philip Bush's work before I met Elisa. And now because of her, I am much more, I, I've never formally met him or spoken with him, but Elisa's in regular contact with him. So he is what well, I would a call. Sur- a surprising thing about him is that he's like super tall. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. That's uh, that's that's something we share in common. I'm I'm also a freakishly tall person. I uh, which unfortunately has never translated into basketball or volleyball, and it just <laughs> has made for very uncomfortable flights and bus rides in my oh, life. Oh, that uh, has to be the worst. Yeah. So that's uh, so. Yeah, I'd happily give up a few inches to anybody who'd take it. But yeah, we have we have a weird <laughs> freakish tall gene in my family that hits a few of us every generation, and I inherit it. So so I'd be, I look forward to seeing Mr. Bush, my my fellow tall person. <laughs> yes, indeed. The, the the story about like the first time we met is pretty funny, but of course, certainly material for another <laughs> for an, an, another episode. I think we kind of mentioned it in the episode. Perhaps I'm not sure. But it involves, you know, some form of food poisoning or similar. And we thinking <laughs> that he had something way worse than that. <laughs> oh, man. He was, and he was coming from, you know, I think it was some some South African country or Central African country. I'm not sure uh, where, where you know, the, the chances that he had picked up something pretty bad were pretty high. <laughs> wow. Well, I, did he, I, I'm sure he recovered. And yeah, yeah, completely. He, it was food poisoning or something like, I mean, not nice, of course, but, you know, relatively normal. <laughs> That's funny. When you say, like, I've, been playing, I've been playing a game lately. I don't know if you're familiar with it called Oxygen Not Included. No. I, I highly recommend it. It's a brilliant, it's an absolutely brilliant survival game where you're a, a colony of duplicants living in the middle of an asteroid trying to survive and eventually build a rocket ship to escape the asteroid. And it's very scientifically accurate. I mean, it's ultimately a science game where you're doing sort of, okay. you know, you're, you're using, you know, you're trying to maintain your levels of oxygen, you're transferring liquids and converting it into gases and all. It's really, really fascinating. But one of the things that can plague your colony is food poisoning. And, and I, I, I recently <laughs> suffered some pretty bad food poisoning virtually in my colony. So that when you mentioned that, I immediately went to that video game. <laughs> Sounds like an exciting one. Is it, is it a commercial video game or, or is it some form of a, of a science project? No, I think I, I would I would categorize it as a commercial video game. Do you know the Don't Starve series? Don't Starve and Don't Starve Together. They're, they're a more popular game from the same studio. They're a Vancouver-based studio. And the, the, the Don't Starve series is quite prominent. And this is their, their second kick at the can, which is oxygen not nice. included. It's really good. It's a fantastic game. Really well done. Really well designed. If you're a fan of these colony building games, you know, Civilization or whatever the case may be, I think you'd really enjoy Oxygen. I used to Not love, good. like, really love Age of Empires too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like crazy. Yeah, me too. I, uh, it I, it I led spent... me into Civilization for a bit, but I still enjoyed more for some reason, probably because it was the first one, the Age of Empires 2. And then I had a weird one that nobody else knew of. I, I can't even remember the name, which was kind of similar to Age of Empires, but not as... I mean, it had different mechanics in, in many ways, but I, I sort of played Civilization because I, I, I enjoyed Age of Empires rather than the other way around, which is more typical. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's I came at Age of Empires from Civilization, although they're very different. One's real-time strategy, the yeah. other one is turn-based, sure. but, but they, there's definitely a connection between the two. And I'm really excited about the new Ages of Empire that just came out. And many people say that it is much more faithful to the second one, which everybody says is the best mm. of the Age of Empires series. Um, however, it's sitting on Steam at $80 right now, and I am reluctant to drop $80 on it. So I'm going to wait a few months until uh, the price <laughs> drops a little bit. And well, you know, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, maybe there's a chance there. There's a chance. I, I had my eyes on it on Black Friday, and there was nothing it, because it only came out about a month ago. So they typically wait until they drop mm. the price, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how it goes because... And that I mean, full disclosure. Mean, yes, I never, never purchase full price <laughs> my games. Like never. Yeah, I, I think very few people. I think you have to be a real fan of the franchise. Yeah. I think the the only time that I have paid full price for games are when the new Civilizations came out earlier in the franchise, because I would literally <laughs> be salivating, waiting for the release to get the, my hands on the new one, and I would pay full price for those. But yeah, I'm with you. I rarely play full price for games. I mean, I can literally wait for a year. I don't mind. Like, I, I usually have more games than I can play. 
<laughs> yeah, so. well, that, that's it. Yeah, that's exactly it. I have a library full of games that, that I have to catch up with, and I probably will never catch up with them. So, Yeah, so so the strategy, <laughs> that sense, and the neediness has changed a lot, uh, you know, throughout the years. We used to have more time than we could you know play games on and now it's you know you kind of have more money to spend on games than than time than you <laughs> well that's <laughs> it. you can spend and, playing them and, and you know what's funny is that it's obviously you know people like you and i who have a real sort of investment in games for for the betterment yeah. of culture and learning and all, all the very beautiful and positive things that games do we obviously have a background in games you know many of us played video games, board games, card games, Dungeons and Dragons, all these great games growing up. But the more invested I have become in teaching about this, writing about this, designing my own games, and then, of course, having children and all these other things, the less I feel like I'm able to play games. And and it's so <laughs> important, you know, it's so important to play games yeah. when you're in our space because the, the, every game helps you think a little bit differently about games and what the potentials are, new mechanics that that, that are being experimented with. So it's this paradox where the more invested you become in the game space, the less time you seem to have to play games. And that's, that's <laughs> something I'm, I'm fighting against all the time. So, so there's, there's two things there. I think one of them is, is the fact that I think the industry, you know, knock on wood, is actually, you know, flourishing in many ways. Like there's more and more consciousness on, on what games can do for so many things, like going from learning to social justice, social good in general you know, games for, for good, like all these things, all the way down to business as well. You know, people, you know, mm. just doing better business uh, thanks to games. And the industry is sort of growing so fast that I'm not sure that we're catching up on the sense that uh, as many people can dedicate themselves or, or want to dedicate themselves to this or realize that there's, you know, possibility to dedicating themselves to this kind of thing. So we're, we're kind of, at least for, for some people, it's kind of exploding in that sense. Like there's more and more things to do. And that makes us, you know, be busier. <laughs> yeah, that's, has that's... the consequence of us of us being busier for sure. I I think that's one of the things that's that's happening there. And the the other one is like it's natural, you know, it's normal that we we get to 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 do some research. I, I was actually I, when I, when you were saying that one of the things I was thinking is at some point I thought that going and doing all the things that we're doing now it would kind of spoil games for me. Like now I play a game and I'm just thinking of the mechanics and what to do with it. But it hasn't happened. <laughs> I, I still ha I'm still happily playing games, enjoying them as much as I did, maybe even more. I don't know. I, I think so. That's my perception at this, at this point. So, you know, I'm happy to have quite a few games to be able to play. And, and as you were saying, like having that variety and playing new games and playing new things, new, new ways of understanding games is definitely helping us further the field, you know, going forward for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, I still derive an enormous amount of enjoyment. Sometimes, you know, I'll, every once in a while you hit on a game and it just doesn't grab me. You know, I'll play for a little bit. I like, there's yeah, very few games and here's my full disclosure. There's very few games that I actually finish. I seem to get to about 50% with most RPGs. <laughs> um, and at the 50% mark, I get a sense of, okay, this is what the game's about. And then inevitably something comes up, some work related thing or, or some, you know, I, I have to start marking or a project comes up. And what's unfortunate about a lot of games, and I think they have to do this better, is that, for example, you know, if you're playing The Witcher 3, for example, a brilliant RPG, as you proceed or you you grow in the game the controller choreography gets more and more sophisticated because you you start yeah. learning new moves and you start learning new new ways to use the character and because you're slowly progressing your level of use is is actually quite demanding in mid game so unfortunately when you stop playing because life gets in the way and you return to the game a month later you've usually forgotten how a lot of those moves work <laughs> and yeah. that becomes a little bit discouraging in continuing the game. I know that that has been a discouragement for me to continue with many games. And here for all the video game company folks that are listening right now, one very useful thing to do would be to allow returning players to practice or tutor up on some of those skills quickly to bring them back into the level of the game that they were playing at before. And although many of those moves are available, like right now what they're doing is, for example, in the skill tree, when you choose the skill, there's a short animated sort of, you know, mini feature on the side or a little animated segment that tells you what buttons to push to, to, 
enact that particular movement. But I don't think it's particularly yeah, it's effective in learning or relearning how to play. And that's why I think so many times when I stop playing a game, I don't often return to it because I've kind of forgotten how to play at the <laughs> level that I need to play in order to continue. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, games are, are very good at taking you to the level, but then it's true. If you, if you drop it for a bit and try to come back, it's probably very difficult. And, you know, especially and, and you know, after a certain age, <laughs> well, that's our it, dexterity right? exactly. is not what it used to be as well. Exactly. And the memory and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like the esports industry, you know, when we, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, there's, it, there's sort of, I don't want to call it ageism because it's not like, but it's, it's even worse than, than, than actual sports. Like you can see, you know, some footballers get into their mid thirties and they're still kind of in the game. You can see like, of course, there's like Cristiano Ronaldo who's like crazy in that sense. But in general, they could get to their mid thirties and that could be sort of a, a good place. If you're an esports, you know, athlete, you get to like 25 and that's it. <laughs> there's no way you're, you're beyond that, right? Yeah, you're put out to pasture at, at 22. That's <laughs> it. Your career is over. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's true. I I had uh, at my UFT class, I had an esports athlete speaking to the class, and you know, I don't think he was more than twenty two years old, and and it was like yeah. speaking to a veteran. I mean, he had you know, he he yeah. had endless stories and anecdotes, and so and definitely coming to the end of his trajectory. So so yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So Paul, is there anything that we left out that you would you would like to to sort of push in into the the end of this episode before before we we move on well i i think you know i i feel that very much like you i would imagine and many people like us i feel that that the idea of using games for learning is a bit of a mission in the sense that i come from a place of feeling that schools are broken and, and I think we can all recognize that to various degrees. Some of the things, you know, are absolute cliches that there are kind of industrial models that are persisting in a digital age and that, you know, they can be very coercive institutions that, that a lot of kids are really bright kids are disenfranchised from schools because the way that the kind of the very monolithic way in which teaching takes place can be very, you know, irrelevant or doesn't correspond well to their ways of learning. All the things that are typically identified as, as the problems with mass education and industrial education, which is really the system that persists in most countries in the world, developed, undeveloped, whatever the case may be. And, you know, what my what the, the basis of my philosophy, the basis of my religion around games and learning is the idea that games are systems and that every game is a variation on a system that one is engaging. That means that typically you want to play the game, that you're in the game, that it's something that's drawing you in and that every game from tic-tac-toe to World of Warcraft in some way is teaching you something. It may not be exactly what you set out to learn. It may be just learning how to play the game itself. It may be strategic learning or it can be very deliberate learning. You could learn about the Iranian Revolution and, you know, 1979 Black Friday. Or uh, you could learn about launching a spaceship and Kerbal Space Program, you know, much more kind of targeted learning. And so I think that what, you know, I would see as the last, you know, third of my life will be spent trying very hard to graft and integrate game systems into education systems. And what I mean by that is it's not just using games for learning, uh, you know, using a video game in your class or using a board game. That's very interesting and very productive because, you know, games are ultimately many of what we call video games are, in fact, simulations. I mean, we were talking about ages of empire and civilization. Those in many ways are historical simulations where we're bringing the past, you know, into the present through a system that recreates an imperfect yeah. version of the past. And, and, and but many, many games. I mean, The Sims are an outright simulation. Tropico is a simulation. And so the word game, what we traditionally think of as game, is a very, very broad kind of umbrella. And simulations allow us to learn by doing. And, and that's very, very important. So that's very good. But more to the point, you know, I'm, I'm a student of Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, and he, he's a very, he has a very pessimistic view of things. And in the end, he, he really feels that it's very difficult for us as individuals to change the world if the systems in which we live don't change. Mm. 
So we can have all kinds of really amazing teachers trying to make life better for their students. But if they're operating within a system that persists in exactly the same way that it has for over 150 years, nothing substantial is going to change. So what I'm most interested in is thinking, well, here we have this incredibly fertile and proliferating gamut and array of systems that we call games that teach in so many different ways, that have so many great ways to engage, that are participatory, that are interactive, that capture our moment as a digital culture that where everything is becoming participatory and interactive. How do we as instructional designers, as, as people who think about teaching and learning, how can we take those systems and reshape the existing school systems inspired by the systems that we call games? And I think that is ultimately sort of my my goal in all of this is thinking about how we can push these game systems and have educators and educational leaders think of it. And one way, and and this, you know, I you know, maybe it'll be of some use to your audience, one way that it's worked out really well in my games and learning class at the University of Toronto is that I teach pre-service teachers mostly. I also teach master's students and PhD students, but a lot of my students are pre-service teachers, so young teachers who are about to go out into the world and teach and learn. And they often take the class because, oh, games sound fun, games and learning. And what's remarkable about it is the way the class is structured is the first third of the class is just, you know, why games and why learning and different ways that we can learn and teach through games. And then the last bit of the class is start shifting to a design class where we start thinking deliberately about game design. We start connecting game design to instructional design. And the final project for the class is that they have to design an educational game, a game that has you know some relevance to education. It could be digital, not digital, whatever the case may be. So what, what's fascinating is that at the beginning of this process, I survey them and most of them do not think of themselves as designers or don't identify themselves as designers, right? And, and one of the things that I think is really important is teachers and anybody in education has to increasingly start positioning themselves as designers. Designing experiences are going to be much more important than, than transferring knowledge. You know, trans, the age of transferring knowledge is dying a very quick death. And what's incredible is one, the games that these non-designers, alleged non-designers design are spectacular. I mean, my greatest regret is not having created some way to preserve these games and share them because they are unbelievable games that these students come up with. Like it's really, they're so original. They're often hybrids of various games put together. They, they work collaboratively to put these together. But what's the point though, and sorry, many of these can be used in their practice. Many second language teachers will use the games they create and actually apply them in their classes. But the point is not really for them to create these games. That's a very nice kind of byproduct, but it's to empower them as designers. And many of them will say at the end of the class that it has proven to be a transformative experience at this class. And, and it, you know, I'd like to take credit for it, but I think that more than anything else, what this class does, this, this kind of games and learning class is it helps them tap into the moment. Many of them have grown up playing games, especially that generation, and they think, oh, it's kind of this waste of time thing that I that's different from, from learning and teaching and the profession I want to pursue. And when that very thin membrane that separates their game background with their teaching kind of bursts and they can put it all together and they realize, you know, I have this incredible resource of mechanics and ideas that could make me a better instructional designer – it not only positions them to be, in my mind, better teachers, but it gets them so much more excited about being teachers when they think of themselves as designers, as artists, as creators that are going to create learning experiences. So I think that's a small way that's starting to nourish a larger vision where games are not just trivial. They're not just like, oh, another nice thing we can use in our classes, but they are particularly reflective of our moment in time. The games, whether digital or non-digital, are an expression of a digital computer culture. Computers are rule-based numeric entities. Games are rule-based numeric entities. We live in an interactive participatory culture. They are an interactive participatory artifact. 
So by tapping into games as systems, I think that we have a way of better aligning schools and learning with the world that we live in. And, and, I, and I think that's a really important message to share. And, you know, if you look at the kind of commonality to all the work that I do, I think it's, it's fueled by that particular vision. Well, if you were not inspired after that, if I, you know, engagers, I'm, I'm going to ask you to check your pulse just in case. <laughs> so, so much inspiration there, you know, so much excitement for games, so many things that can be achieved. I didn't even want to interject at any point just to, you know, so, sort of let that flow because I, I was feeling how that was building up. So again, if you're not excited about that, check your pulse just in case, because, you know, that was pretty, pretty inspiring. Oh, thank you, Rob. It comes, you know, it comes from the heart of a kid who kind of hated school, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and who loved games and, and somehow has, has found a way to, to make school better through games. And, and I, I, you know, I, I really appreciate you giving me the forum and the platform to share my thoughts. And I, I always find your show to be great because you're such a thoughtful and engaging host and you're such a good listener and you have that ability to really kind of get to the core of an issue. So it's always such a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you as well for investing your time today. I know we were discussing one of the things is our busyness lately and how much stuff we have on our plate. So special thank you in that sense as well for taking the time, investing the time in this audience and the engagers in this whole, all of these reflections that we, we went through today as well. However, Paul, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And I'd like to know, how are you listening to this podcast? Are you doing it through a podcasting app or are you doing it through the web? If so, if you're following it through a podcasting app, you know, on your mobile or however else, have you followed and rated the podcast? Oh, please go ahead and do so if you haven't. That way we can reach more engagers just like you to achieve our mission of making learning amazing. And if you want any instructions, if you want to have a quick know-how at least of some of the apps, you can go to professorgame.com slash iTunes. And before you go on to your next mission, remember, remember to hit that subscribe or that follow button absolutely for free and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.